Hello, good afternoon. And um, it, DFI Video welcomes you to the seventh and the last webinar in this series, educational series on steel, retaining structures and foundations. My name is Mary Ellen Large, and I direct the technical activities for Deep Foundations Institute, and I am located in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I'm very happy to be with you this morning, your afternoon, to join in this last webinar on steel design. So please note that the recording of this webinar is prohibited. Certificates will be prepared and emailed to you within approximately two weeks. Online webinar recording along with the presentation slides will be provided to you after the webinar series ends um, in approximately two weeks. If you have any trouble during this webinar, you need some assistance, our capable DFI of India staff is, is at the ready to help you. So please contact Mr. Mahendran or Mr. Pranav Jha at these numbers or these email addresses and they will be happy to help you. These details are also available in the chat box. So just a reminder of the control panel for GoToWebinar, please click the full screen mode to show the slides in and get the best viewing experience to show the slides in full screen mode, please. And if you're having trouble hearing, be sure that your computer audio button is pushed. You might be on um, no audio, so be sure that you're on the computer audio button. And in the handouts tab on the dashboard, there are also several handouts of brochure for the steel webinar series, the ArcelorMittal rental flyers, the brochure for the DFI upcoming DFI 2020 conference, and um, the, the PDF presentation from this, from this webinar series. Um, below the handouts is a questions tab. That's where you would en enter your questions to uh, that the speaker will address at the end of the presentation. So be sure to include your name and your organization name when you enter your questions so that we may properly introduce you when we, when we approach your question. We'd like to thank our webinar sponsors, ArcelorMittal, Projects India. Uh, we couldn't do this webinar series without you, so we're very happy to have your, their, their sponsorship and, and their support. And our se webinar series co-sponsor is Teamwork Engineering Solutions. So thank you. We are very pleased with the registrations that we've had for this webinar series. Over almost a thousand people have registered for the webinar series, which is, which is terrific. And there's a, a really nice distribution of member types and it, it mimics very closely the distribution of member types of DFI. So we have a nice academic fraction of 31%, consultants almost 30%, contractors almost 25%, and uh, equipment and manufacturer service providers. So it's a nice distribution and that's one of the hallmarks of DFI is to have all participants, all stakeholders involved so that everyone's viewpoint is addressed and respected. So in addition to the types of members that have joined the webinar series, we have a, a wonderful geographic distribution. So over, so 43 countries and, and Every continent is represented in the, in the registrants for this webinar series. And since the last webinar, we've had two more countries join, join our party, and it's ports from Portugal and South Africa. So this is a map that shows the, the wide distribution of, of representation around the world of interest in this, in this great webinar series. So we'll follow a similar sequence as we have with the past webinars. We will introduce our speaker. He will make our pres a presentation for us. We'll then take a quick poll on the next educational series. So DFI of India will be presenting a new series following this one. And we are we'd like to get your input on which topics you would, you would like to see. Uh, we'll have some promotional videos. We'll, in we'll enjoy a question and answer session with the attendees and the speaker. And then we will talk about the upcoming DFI of India 2020 10th anniversary conference that's coming up in November, in th this month in November, and then we'll end the series. 
So it's my pleasure to introduce this seventh webinar on hot rolled steel sheet piles, techno-economic approach for temporary applications by Mr. Jal Martins, the head of technical and marketing department for ArcelorMittal Commercial RPS. He's based in Luxembourg. So a quick introduction because Mr. Ma Mr. Martins has, has made other presentations in this webinar series, but he started his professional career as an inspector, inspecting, inspection engineer and consulting firm in Luxembourg. He's been with ArcelorMittal since 1999, and he's held several positions in technical and the marketing department. He has been, he's designed sheet piles and, and attended projects all over the world. And now he works in the marketing department and is the link between R&D and the sales department. So his main mission is to, is to present innovative and new solutions for sheet piles. So we welcome Mr. Martins to give us a presentation. Thank you and welcome. Thank you very much, Mary Ellen. So uh, start my presentation. Okay, so the presentation will be about um, temporary applications. Uh, we've seen in the past um, webinars that uh, there are different type of applications and here we'll really focus on temporary and how to design it without going to the details but also how to install it and some specific details where you have to be quite careful about it so let's start with um, a nice picture of uh, a project um, that was the first time i went to india it was back in 2011 um, and i had the pleasure to visit the job site where uh, they had uh, they were building uh, pier foundations for a bridge and they were quite deep the deepest one was around 20 meters maybe a little bit more than 20 meters and as you can see it's quite impressive i mean there are a few things that can be uh, really seen on, on this picture the first one is that it's deep of course the second one is that you have a lot of struts um, the third one is that um, the struts um, are closest to the bottom so uh, you have one at the top and then at the bottom they get really close because when you use a subgrade reaction models designed for instance you'll see that the loads that you get on the bottom are higher than at the top which is quite logical but this means also that you have to be careful and you have to design it um, with a certain carefulness in order not to overstress the struts the first thing that uh, is quite interesting on this picture is that um, you have you don't have any struts uh, that go from one side to the other so all the struts are um, at the corners it is quite a challenge because this introduces horizontal loads into the wall axis which have to be taken into account but on the other side you can build inside of the cofferdam without having these struts which could hinder the execution of the bridge beer as you, you can see here so another picture it's quite interesting because I will show you other slides where um, I will probably tell you that uh, when you are installing sheet piles, you don't have to be that careful about the position of the sheet piles. Yes, it is true. It is not as uh, important as for permanent structure like an underground car park. But on the other side, you have to install it within uh, tolerances. Otherwise, you have what you can see here. Uh, the strut is not fully um against the sheet pile so the sheet pile deformed a little bit more in the middle than in the corners and then you need to position uh, some elements in order to have this contact between the sheet pile and the strutting system another nice picture of a temporary bridge uh, sorry of a temporary application is for a tunnel this one is in maastricht so it's a uh, relatively simple you excavate well you install the sheet piles you put the struts you excavate and then you build inside the concrete structure and once you are finished you extract you pull out the sheet piles and then you can reuse them for the next phase or you can recycle them so it's uh, relatively simple on paper and on the picture on the right you can imagine that we are talking here not only about not exactly 20 meters like in the other one but here we are anywhere between 10 meters and 15 meters. What you can also see is that you have this, um, this uh, 
cofferdam uh, that is used to build the concrete structure inside. But on the other side, outside, you have also a sheet pass for this temporary because um, here you have an approach. So you have an entrance to the tunnel and there they had a second uh, retaining structure on the side. And it's quite impressive. So you have also here, interestingly, struts that do not only work in compression, but also in tension. So you have to make sure that the, fix, the fixing of the struts can take those boats' loads. And then another picture, which is also quite impressive. This is a roundabout in uh, Switzerland where they have an underpass and a roundabout on the top. So they use the sheet pass that you can see here just to be able to excavate, to build the uh, structure, the concrete structure. And then once they have built it, they extract the pass and then they can reuse them for other applications. Now, when do we need to use retaining walls or when can we use slopes? Well, um, this is an extract of the German standard, uh, DIN. For instance, if you are in clays, you can excavate down to 1.25 meters with a maximum of 1.75 without needing a support. If you go be beyond those elevations, in that case, you need a support. So very often for a small trench, you can have these, can have these temporary supports. Of course, if you have a, a coffer dam which is 10 meters deep, then you need something more than a simple support at the top. Slopes are also a solution. It will depend mainly on the soil composition, so the soil properties. You need a certain slope angle, which will depend on the soil properties. So very often for sand, this slope is relatively, angle is relatively small. If you are in the clay, you can have a higher one. You have also to be careful about the loads, like traffic loads for the job site and so on, and also be very careful about water. So when you have water, of course, you need something which is impervious because it could be um, one of the uh, governing uh, design factors. On the other side, if you have the possibility to pump the water from the soil, then a slope could be a solution. Now, small reminder that I already made in the last um, webinar. So when you're talking about sheet piling, there is actually no standards which will um, give you the shapes and the interlock types of uh, the sheet pipes. So the section properties depend on the manufacturers. This has also an influence on the interlock strengths, which is not really required except if you have a flat sheet pass, but it has also an influence on the water tightness. So using different sheet pass or different interlocks may have an influence on the water tightness and also on the sealing systems that can be used. So row intolerances are very important. And then according to the European standard, which is EN 1993 part five, it is valid for all the hot rod sheet piles. On the other side, there may be some reduction factors to be applied to Z piles if you have high water pressures, like we'll see, or if you have U piles, you may also have to use a reduction factor. So, this means that um, the optimization is a relatively complex um, topic. The other thing is that, uh, as I already explained in the past, normally it is better to use a high strength steel grade, but not all sheet piles are available in all those steel grades. You have also to be careful about that. And as I said, so optimization of the geotechnical design and the chosen section combination with the steel grade reduces the costs and environmental impact, but it's a relatively costs effective, but also time consuming uh, task. Now for uh, temporary applications, however, we have to look at it from a different perspective because if you use rental sheet piles or reuse piles that you have on your stockyard, then of course you'll try to adapt the geotechnical design to what you have on stock or what you can get really quickly, if, mainly if it's a small coffer dam. So in this, in this case, you may not try to optimize um, to the full parameters, but you'll try to optimize the design based on the uh, sheet piles that you have. So playing with the levels 
of the anchors, the numbers of the anchors, and also um, the water levels and the loadings. So this is a little bit different for temporary applications. Unless you have time or it's a very complex structure like this one, like on this picture where you can reuse the sheet piles a couple of times. And in that case, of course, you can wait for the rolling from the mill and then you will optimize the sheet pile as you would actually be doing a design for a permanent. Now, there are different types of designs. As uh, one of my colleagues says, there is a design which provides the optimal sheet pile section. And then you have the good design, which takes into account drivability. Quite important, as we've already seen in one of the presentations from my colleague Ernst Weber, because you may have the best design on paper. If you cannot drive the sheet pass to the full extent, then uh, you have a big issue at the job site. So this is something that you have to take into account. And then for temporary applications, uh, a great design will not only consider the sheet pass section, so the cost effectiveness, the drivability, but also the availability of the driving equipment and also the sheet pile sections that you are, have on stock either at your own yard or at uh, a trading company. So let's assume that uh, we can do these uh, great designs. What are the parameters that you have to take into account and what are the difference between permanent and temporary works? So I won't go through all the details, but there are a few things that should be taken into account. So ask yourself those questions. When are the sheet piles needed? So can you purchase them? Can you wait for a couple of weeks to get them delivered to the job site or is it a small coffer dam where you need them very quickly? Um, the second question is what are the ground conditions? So hard soil conditions, normal soil conditions, very soft like you find it for instance in, in the Netherlands or in sandy soils. Do I have uh, sufficient uh, equipment available? Um, if I have a geek and press like you saw in one of the in, in the last um, webinar, uh, I can press the sheet piles into the ground, I have some limitations, but on the other side, if I have very long piles and very compact soils, I would probably need an impact hammer. Is it available or not? The other thing is, when do you have to install the sheet piles? Usually for temporary applications, normally you get to go ahead and then you have to start directly. And how important is the cost of the sheet piles? So as I said, for a permanent wall, you can try to optimize it because you will anyway buy the sheet piles or rent the sheet piles that you need, but uh, you'll have to wait a little bit to get them at the job site. If it's for temporary, then in that case, um, you have to rent whatever is at, um, at the stockyard. And then the cost of the sheet pile itself is not the most important thing because you have also to take into account the cost of the strutting system and the cost of installation. So once we have seen those questions and you have the answers to those questions, you can start with the design. And I won't go into the detail of the design, just a few um, words about how to optimize. If you take, for instance, the recommendations, the German recommendations EAB, uh, you will see that uh, a lot of um, those uh, methods are quite simplified methods where uh, based on the soil conditions and the number of struts, you will assume that you have a typical um, loading on the sheet pass sections, and then you can calculate it with a simplified method. However, uh, you have to be careful about it because nowadays with the soil structure interaction methods, it's much easier to determine more accurately the loads on the, um, on the strutting system. So we will obviously recommend for, especially if you have a deep coffer dams, to use a finite element or subgrade reaction model to do that calculations. You don't not only have to verify the stability of the sheet pile, but also the overall um, stability. So the uh, base heave, for instance, which is quite important, and also uh, be very careful about the water. I said in one of my presentations that water is the enemy of the engineer, and especially in this case, it can be quite uh, drastic, uh, or it can govern the um, design. So, a few examples. For instance, if you have a cantilever wall, well, the wall, the sheet pile wall, will be relatively long, and the deflections also. But most of the time, if you are not in an urban area, deflections will not be the governing factor. So you can assume that you get uh, 10 centimeters of deflection without any problem if it's only temporary you're not talking about permanent 
Now, if you go a little bit deeper, above four or five meters, then in that case, you will need at least one strut or one anchor level. For temporary applications, um, normally people tend to use struts because it's easier to install and it doesn't go into the ground, so it's also easier to extract uh, after having uh, built the structure inside. So in this case, for instance, with a minus six meter, you would need a sheet pile which is a little bit longer than the cantilever before, but with one strut level. Now, if you go deeper, um, you would need more struts. And here I compare it by minus six meters, the same thing, but without struts, if you have sufficient space behind, you could excavate like one, two or three meters and then only install the sheet pile. So you are actually having something which is like a cantilever wall. So you don't have any struts or anchors to install, but on the other side, you need a sufficient space behind to be able to excavate. So those are two solutions that are available. Of course, those are not always applicable. You have to check which one is the most um, economic from the economic, well, from financial point of view, but also the installation time. Because if you have to install a strut, it takes a little bit of time. You have to weld a couple of things. The sheet pile in the second case on the right will be a little bit longer, but not that much longer. So it also depends on the uh, sheet pile length that you have on stock. Now, if you go deeper, as I said, you'll probably need two or three levels of anchors. So usually, as I said, the first one is quite close to the top at uh, approximately one or two meters, because this will be the cantilever stage. And then you excavate. And if you go deeper, for instance, like you saw by almost minus 20, you will need long piles, but you need also quite a number of struts. So for instance, here, what is interesting to know is that, well, you can try to have the struts at equal uh, heights, but generally speaking, you will notice that the reactions in the deeper struts are much higher than on the top. So you will not always have the same strutting system at the top. It will be a relatively small one, light, and then at the bottom, as you saw on the first picture, it is a relatively massive strutting system. But of course, you have also to be careful about the position of the last strut because very often you need a relatively thick uh, concrete layer and you still need some space to be able to excavate and also to install and to start building um, the concrete uh, structure inside. So that's what I was saying. So usually um, H4, it's much more than H1 and so on. So the distance between the strutting system. Now, about installation tolerance. Well, we should, we have shown a few pictures about installation when you're installing a permanent wall. Normally you take um, the panel driving, which is the best method to do it, or with a um, leader guided vibratory hammer or impact hammer and a more simplified template at the um, soil level. Well, this takes time and of course you get a very uh, straight wall normally and good tolerances, but very often when we're talking about installation of temporary structures, the contractors do not take that much care about the position of the sheet pass. So it is true that we are less concerned about um, right installation, but nevertheless, you have to be uh, within uh, certain tolerances in order to prevent a couple of things that I'll show on one of the next slides. The other disadvantage when you have uh, the panel driving is that you have to thread the piles at the relatively height, uh, which is not accessible to the people. So it's almost impossible to do it by hand. So you need some equipment or you need what you see here on the left, a threader, which is um, um, a small tool, well, quite uh, developed tool that helps you actually thread the piles at a certain height. So this is the way we would recommend to, to use. Now, when you do the pen, pitch and drive, of course, you don't have these issues because you drive the pile to the final level and then you can thread it at the ground level. Now, if you talk about support sync systems like struts, there are different ways to do it. So the best ones are hydraulic systems where you can actually push the loads with, with the, these hydraulic systems. You can push the struts against the, the sheet pass 
and these are relatively easy to install. They are a little bit more expensive uh, for sure, but on the other side, you are much more flexible and you don't have the, so many uh, difficulties, especially if the installation is not done uh, quite good. So quick installation and also for the removal, very easy to do. And you can even add some monitoring devices so that you know exactly if um, you are within the safety factors that uh, you had. So this is also quite a nice feature of those hydraulic systems. There are many manufacturers, well, many. There are a couple of manufacturers specializing in this type of um, hydraulic systems. They are quite good, a little bit more expensive, as I said, but from a safety point of view, much better than other ones where you use struts. So struts meaning that you can have a tube, you can have a, a, an H pile, or you can have an H section. So those are also alternatives. But as I said, modular supporting systems are, in my opinion, the best way to go, especially for very complex uh, structures. This is a nice uh, picture of uh, a temporary application. So this is a construction of a key wall in um, the UK, in Dover. And to build, um, um, well, actually for a building that goes from one side to the, to the marina, they had to excavate relatively deep, and that's the way uh, they did it, so in different phases. That's also the advantage. They did first the phase above, and then once they were finished, they took part of those sheet piles and then reinstalled it here. And as you see also, you have these um, strutted elements, which are not perpendicular. So this is a way to try to optimize the strutting system, which is uh, quite useful. And I'll show you other pictures, and then at the end, I'll come back to the techno, um, economical approach. So another way to do it here you see also quite deep two strutting levels. At the corners you have these um, struts that go from one sheet to, from one wall to the other one. As I said this introduces horizontal loads into the axis of the walls which have to be taken into account but it was too large so here they had also to use struts in the middle at a certain elevation but uh, this is also something that has to be designed. If we go to um, this picture, here it's to show that um, in some cases, uh, depending on the, the soil conditions for sure, but also depending on the applications, rather than having struts, you can go to anchors. So anchors take a little bit more time for the installation. It's relatively easy, but you have to test them. And here you see two anchor levels, so two anchor levels, one at the top and one at the um, at bottom. There is no railing, so this means that here every sheet pile, so every double pile normally is anchored. This is a way to do it. You can also have um, a whaler, as you'll see in one picture. But what we'll also see in this picture is that at the top, you can use this whaler, so you don't anchor all piles but if you go to the bottom one then the loads are much higher and in this case you would have to, anyway to you uh, to anchor each double pile so that in this case they don't use this whaler system anymore but they use uh, directly the anchor so this means here every second or every third pile is anchored and here at the bottom every pile is anchored If we go to the next slide, it's also a temporary structure. On the left one, you see uh, the installation for the metro of Vienna in Austria, where they used it in a certain phases. So they built like 150 meters of um, um, the concrete structure. And then once they were finished, they extracted the piles and then went to the next uh, step uh, so that they reused the sheet piles at least five times on the same job site and once uh, the sheet piles had been used five or six times they were um, scrapped and actually recycled after that so here also interesting is to know that to see that they only used one strut level so this means that they could actually build the whole structure below this this means also that you may need a thicker pile a stronger pile but you don't have the um, uh, hindrance of uh, an additional strut that would actually complicate the building 
of the or direction of the concrete uh, tunnel. Now you see also here on this one it's for the bridge uh, for a bridge pier where uh, they use this uh, cover dam and what they do also quite often this is more in front is that they leave the sheet piles and this serves then also as a protection. So once they have built the bridge pier they fill it with sand and they leave the sheet piles and that's a bridge protection against impact from vessels for instance. On the next slide, it's um, a nice picture of a relatively complex structure, very wide. So it's for um, for an underground car park where you see the size of the tubes that you have there and also the supports here in the middle. So vertical supports to reduce the buckling length of the piles. And I like this. Uh, job because here you had two things. On one side you see that the struts or the whaling system matched perfectly the position of the sheet pass, so the sheet pass were installed uh, quite accurately. But on the other side, and this is due to the fact that the frame was prefabricated, there was a gap. So if you have a small gap you can put something like wood. If you have a bigger gap you have to uh, find a solution here. What they did is they used some uh, plastic bags that they filled with concrete and then uh, they put them so that they could fill the gap between the sheet pile and the strut in order to avoid the deformation of the sheet pile because here they, it would have been a little bit too much. Now those are solutions, practical solutions that can be done uh, based on the um, project, adapted to the project. And the other questions that the people ask very often is what is the best sheet pile uh, for reuse? So there are different opinions. So in some countries, a lot of people use Z pass. Well, the Netherlands, for instance, 99 or let's say more than 95%, I would say 99% are Z pass, especially the 800 range nowadays because they are very light. In other countries, we see the standard U pass, 600 millimeter wide piles, which in fact are very strong. They are also a little bit heavier. And then you have also uh, wide piles like the 750 millimeters, which is a, a good compromise. They are light, but yet you can drive them in very long lengths. So you have to choose the one which is best fitted for your job site. Now, if you really have to drive sheet piles into very hot soil conditions, uh, then of course we have developed, well, you'll find it also from other manufacturers, but um, there are some sheet piles that were developed specifically for these conditions in which you see this reinforced corner which in fact stabilizes the profile and makes it a very good profile to drive in very hard soils for instance. And of course very hard soils means also that they are relatively good for reuse so it's a very good profile for a rental business. Now the other question is is it preferable to use single piles or double piles? Well, from our perspective, it's clear that you should use double piles, preferably with crimping, so that you don't have to reduce the safety factors, or sorry, you don't have to reduce the properties according to Eurocode 3 part 5. Nevertheless, we see a lot of people still using U piles, and that's not an issue because if you have it on your yard and you have over-designed it because you need uh, smaller section properties, then you can without any problems, use a U power. For instance, if you have a PU18 and you need only a GU6, of course, you're using a little bit more steel than required, but on the other side, you are, have um, a large safety factor and you can reuse the sheet piles over and over again. So we see that normally you can reuse them up to 10 times depending on the soil conditions and the sheet pile. But nevertheless, it's also recommended to use high steel grades so high strength steel grades. Nowadays S355 is a standard. If you should buy uh, stock, so sheet piles for stock, we would recommend to go to um, S430 GP and even above, so the 460, because this gives you a lot of advantage. They are maybe a little bit more expensive when you buy them because of the premium of the additions of uh, alloys that we need to put into the steel. But on the other side, you can drive them into very hard soil, because you have a higher steel grade, so higher resistance, and 
also the bending moment capacity is increased. And even if you don't really need it for a specific project, you might actually uh, need it for another one. So our recommendation would be to go to a S430 if you are buying something uh, for stock material. Another advantage of the sheet piles uh, with the last interlock is that uh, you have um, deviation of uh, five degrees per free interlock. So this means that you can do this type of curves without needing special piles with the connectors and so on. Well, if you go above those five degrees, of course, you need a, either a connector, especially if you have a 90 degrees, or you have to bend the piles. But quite often, this is one of the cases, if you have a diameter above um, 15 meters, then you should be able to do it without special parts. On the next picture, so I'll, I'll go through a, a couple of pictures, but first of all, uh, there is a video quite interesting in an urban area. So you, you saw, well, it's a time lapse, of course, it's uh, <laughs> relatively fast. But um, in fact, one of the advantages of those temporary sheet power rolls is that uh, they can be installed relatively quickly. You saw also that they had uh, these vibratory hammers, they had the uh, presses, uh, also in the urban area without uh, um, disturbance. And the advantage is really this quick installation and speed of execution. For this, uh, it was an underpass. Now, um, Another type of uh, infrastructures, well, very often you use also bridge abutments for permanent um, structures, but here it was a temporary bridge with steel. So the deck is in steel, but also the abutments are um, with steel. And once they have actually built the new or repaired the, the existing uh, bridge, then they will dismantle this and uh, they can reuse them in other parts. Now, let me just grab the laser pointer. A couple of other pictures from other countries. So here you see also a temporary along a road where you have to excavate. Again, we are talking about uh, seven, eight, nine, ten meters, depending on on the position. 
But again, you drive the sheet piles into the ground. Once you're finished, you can extract them and um, you can reuse them. Other pictures, um, a more uh, closer look. So this is one in you know, also in the Netherlands where they had to use some anchors because you, you didn't have any space for the struts inside. Um, so you can drive the sheet pass very close to existing structures, uh, be it uh, now roads, be it foundations, be it also rail tracks. Um, we saw a couple of pictures uh, already in the past. So here the advantage really, you install them and then you uh, pull them out and you can reuse them in other projects. A cover dam circular as the one that I showed you for building a bridge pier. So this is the a circular one, as I said, once you have a, a diameter of 15 meters and more, you can install that without any uh, uh, without any special piles. Uh, you can also see that uh, you have four different, well, three, four levels of struts, and the difference in height between the second and the third one is much less than between the first and the second one. So as I said, the loads, the deeper you go, the higher you get the loadings. Another coffer dams, quite impressive, and here especially it's to also for a high speed line, so to pass below this uh, canal. And this is quite impressive because you have to imagine that you have approximately 10 meters between the strut here and the position of the bottom slab. And this can only be achieved with, well, first of all, very strong sheet paths, of course. You get a lot of loads on the struts and uh, deflections which are acceptable but which are in the range of uh, 10 to 20 centimeters which is not a big deal but you see that here you can build something without any interference of the strutting system when we're talking about uh, 10 meters uh, the ones that i already shown you so here um, you see that um, it's a metro line so on the first one you didn't see but it's also very close to existing structures or existing buildings another picture where uh, you see that there is a combination of a retaining wall so that's the first retaining wall to prevent the water from seeping and then you have this slope so that uh, it's like if you had a dike you have a, a reinforcement of the slope so that it prevents or it increases the stability of this embankment which is as you can also use them for uh, pressing shafts like uh, you see here so here it's a very small one but you have this trench and once you're finished you extract the piles another one where you can see here it's the entrance to a tunnel so this is a cut and cover and then at a certain point it goes into a tunnel you can also pass through the sheet piles. Uh, another example where you see also where you have this uh, relatively simple bracing systems at, at the top and at the bottom you have a more complex one, an hydraulic one. And here you see that uh, the sheet piles have been installed very close to existing buildings. So it is possible and also a huge diameter pipe so that you have five to six meters between the um, struts but of course in that case you have also to increase the diameter of the pipe it's a quite complex one where you see a lot of steel for the strutting system so it's another way it would probably be easier to do with the pipes but that's a choice of the engineer Another circular shaped coffer dam. Here it's uh, much more than 15 meters, so here you don't need any special pile. Another picture that is coming. Uh, yes, so again, circular cofferdams where you can use either steel 
whalers, or you can also use concrete, like you see it here. And the concrete has an advantage is that it works to have a compression load, and here it works in compression, and concrete works very well in compression, uh, which is not necessarily the case um, for the steel beams. Another cover dam, quite deep, just to show you. Okay, when we're talking about very high water pressures, as I said in the beginning, if you have U piles, normally you don't have to reduce the um, section properties, but for Z piles, you have to take that into account. So there is a table in Eurocode 3 part 5 which gives you the reduction factor based on the sheet pile, on the steel grade, and also on the water pressure. So that's also one of the reasons why cold form sheet piles, which are relatively thin, we're talking about three millimeters, six millimeters, are not the ideal solutions. For the second, the second reason is that the interlocks are not as watertight as the hot rod. So that sometimes people try to use cold formed, but definitely if you have high water pressures above five meters, um, hot rolled are the, the solutions, uh, the preferred solutions, be it u pass or z pass. Another picture where you see also the strutting system can be adapted because, you, well, depending on the, the width of the cofferdam and also the elements that have to be cast inside. But most of the time, of course, you have a lot of uh, Coffer dams that are built in the water. You have also what we call a double wall coffer dam, as you can see here. So it's a double wall that's backfilled with sand normally. This is relatively stable, much more than a single, and especially useful if you have very high water loads or if you have waves. Uh, there is another picture where you see a double wall coffer dam here also. So it can also be round. So this is the internal wall and that's the external wall and both walls are connected with tie rods and whaling systems and those can also be very deep so here probably around more than 10 meters if you have to build a trench for a pipe that goes into the water can also be dug with those temporary sheet pile walls and then you extract them and then i have another picture of the same launching so it's a trench where you actually build the trench and then you put the pipeline and then you go into the water that's very often for um lng and then of course what i've already presented in the past this straight rev steel sheet pile coffer dams which can rest on the rock so you don't need any embedment in the ground those are huge structures, of course, for very deep coffer dams here. It was at more than 15 meters. With the tidal, it went up to 18 meters. So that's uh, a lot of uh, loadings. Also, temporary for the um, uh, powerhouse here, it's in Guatemala, but there were a lot that were built also in the Mississippi River in the United States with the coffer dams. And then Temporary applications where it's for the repair of the shipyard. So in that case, you install those coffer dams, you backfill, and once you have finished, you can actually extract the piles again and the backfill, and, and that's it. So uh, another one which is quite interesting, and this is really a temporary because you can still see it from uh, Google Maps. It's still there, but it was only used for uh, the building of the bridge elements for this uh, Rion Antirion bridge in Greece. And now it's um, it's there, but uh, they could actually have recovered the sheet pass because uh, quite interesting. Now, what about the techno commercial aspects? What is the best solution? Is it to purchase the sheet pass or to rent? Or there's another option which is buyback. So this will really depend on the project. And I'm stuck again. So for temporary applications, normally um, when we talk about temporary applications, we talk about uh, duration of three months to three years. Three years being a very long uh, temporary application, but uh, that uh, happens. Most of the time it's for small excavations, coffer dams in rivers. That's where you can actually use uh, rent sheet piles. Here, yeah, um, it's a project in France where they used the sheet pass to build this tunnel below uh, this uh, river. The thing is also that they did not recover 100%. So once they were, had, were finished, 
they left a portion inside, so they cut off at the, at the riverbed level, and this was used in order to protect the existing foundations from erosion. So that's also um, a possibility, so everything that's above the level you recover it, and then the rest you leave it, which can also be a, a permanent. So they can be driven into the ground and extracted with the same equipment, usually it's a vibratory hammer, and can be used up to 10 times. Well, that's a, really the maximum. Sometimes you use them three, four times. And what you have also to take into account is the fact that very often when you drive them, especially in hot driving conditions, you damage the top or the tip, and then you have to cut a little bit, so uh, half a meter or something like this, so that when you want to rent sheet powers, the best thing is to buy or to rent sheet powers that are longer than the minimum length that you need for the whole project, so that you make sure that at the end you still have the length that is required to be uh, safe installed. And then, of course, they can be recycled at the end of life. Now, most of the traders and also the manufacturers, they have a, a small stock in different locations based on market intelligence. So this means that uh, based on uh, what is uh, used in those countries, you'll find some uh, sheet piles on stock, different steel grade, different sh sections, different uh, lengths. And this is different in every region. So every country might have their own uh, stock because some countries use U piles, others use uh, Z piles, different lengths also depending on the soil conditions. Now, the advantage of renting sheet piles is that the contractor doesn't need to invest so much capital. So it's very interesting for small and medium companies with small credit lines because then they rent only what they need. And once uh, they have done their project, they, um, the sheet piles are returned to the rental. And the other thing is that you can rent exactly what fits your specific needs. So if you need a strong sheet pile for a specific job, you can rent a strong sheet pile. If you need a lighter sheet pile, you will need rent a lighter sheet pile. If you have your own stock, of course, you may only have one pile or one type of pile and one length. So, of course, this is a lot of capital which is employed. They can be delivered just in time, so you don't need to the, wait for the rolling mills. And you don't need your own stock because it's also a capital. And you need also people which are qualified to do this, um, mm, this maintenance. And the alternative, which is also a good option, especially for long-term uh, rentals, when it's long-term long meaning one year, two years, and three years, it's a buyback. So this means that um, you buy the sheet pass, and then you get in this buyback contract an option to sell them back to the to the to the manufacturer or to the to the trader, and in this case you get a, a specific uh, amount of money for the sheet pass if they are in a good condition, and this can be more interesting than renting uh, if you don't know how long you will need them. As I said, sometimes you have long sheet pass on stock or shorter sheet pass. Sometimes you need to uh, splice them, so splicing takes uh, time and it's also a cost factor. So very often, as I said at the beginning, you'll try to do with whatever you have on stock. But nevertheless, if there is no other option, in that case, you, you have to splice. Splicing of stock material or reuse material is nevertheless more interesting than buying new sheet files if you don't need them that often. So those are things that can be done at the subcontractor. And if you have your own stock, you have to uh, select the piles that you need based on your own needs. So if you are a small contractor and you do only small jobs, maybe you need a specific sheet pile. If you are a large contractor, you would need probably different types of sheet piles, different types of slangs, and so on. So this is also uh, very important to uh, make the wrong, uh, sorry, to make the right decisions because the wrong decision can be quite uh, um, Yes, so it can be quite, um, well, can cost a lot of money. And uh, if you look at the, this picture, uh, you see that, uh, as I said, sometimes uh, you damage a sheet pile, so you have to cut off a small piece so that when you rent sheet piles, rent uh, longer piles uh, if you have to reuse them at the same job site, just in case you need them.
that's a case study which I find quite interesting because here, as I said, when you you rent whatever you need for a specific car uh, for a specific project. So here they use PU28, they use PU32, they use PU31. It's almost the same um, section, but in different steel grades and also in different lengths. So this means uh, the contractor had that at the job site, uh, sorry, at their own stockyard, and they tried to use them. So they adapted the design also to be able to use what they had on stock. And then for the environmental impact, well, that's a small example, uh, which I, I won't go through. Uh, I will just highlight the fact that if you reuse the sheet piles, comparing to uh, not reusing, there's a huge impact on the environmental impact. So this means that reusing reduces the environmental impact of the carbon footprint and all the other indicators, which is a good thing for the for the planet and also economically uh, an excellent choice. Now, there was also a study that was made in Switzerland in 2014 comparing uh, sheet pile walls with the concrete walls and the fact that you can recover the sheet piles and reuse them made that the environmental impact and mainly the carbon footprint was three to four times lower depending on the solution. So if it was a cantilever sheet pile or anchor sheet pile compared to uh, slurry walls or diaphragm, uh, sorry, or um, second pile walls because in fact at that time it's and today it's still impossible to recover the concrete walls whereas you can reuse the sheet pile walls and that's the main difference in this result. So um, if I go back, that's another interesting thing. It's about the speed of execution and the cost of a retaining wall. So this is for a permanent uh, wall. It was a study that was made by a renowned uh, Dutch um, design engineering company, Witte Vinden in 2019, in which you see that uh, alternative solutions in those specific cases, and because it's uh, soft soils, water at around one meter below ground level, and uh, the equipment that they have in, in the Netherlands, which uh, is quite uh, awesome. So the um, sheet pile solution was cheaper, and the alternatives in this case was at least 40% more expensive. And if you look at the execution time, for this underground car park, they needed 12 weeks, and the second pile wall would have needed 15 weeks, and the cutter soil mix wall would have needed 17 weeks. So you also save uh, at least uh, five weeks in this case, which would be the same uh, for um, temporary walls. And my last slide is about uh, how, well, when we talked about threading the piles and using single piles and double piles, so this is a way how you can also do a temporary application with single piles which are not threaded. It's not the way we would recommend to do it, but if you don't have water, it can also work. Good. I would like to thank you for your attention. And there is another video of a temporary application which is quite impressive also, so um, we'll see you after the next video. Thank you very much.
So thank you. Thank you. So I'm Mary Ellen Large. I'm, I'm back again to help uh, wrap up this, this webinar and, and to, to continue with the Q&A. And uh, I'm, I, I was so impressed by that video and by this presentation. And thank you so much, Mr. Martins, for that uh, very practical overview of the use of sheet piles for temporary applications. So it's very energizing. So thank you. Thank you. Um, So our next, our next activity is to talk about these educational webinars. So our next, we will be launching, uh, announcing a new educational series in December and launching the new webinar series in January. But we need to, we would really like to have your input on what topics that you're interested in. So we're gonna run this quick poll. So if you could just click on the screen of the, of the technical, topic that most interests you please select one and uh, when the poll is finished we will we will synthesize that information again address the uh, announce the topic in december and we will launch the webinar in january so we'll leave it just a, a minute for you to make your selections Okay, great. So we will we will be excited about, about making those announcements shortly. So moving on to thank our sponsors again. We couldn't do these webinar series without our, our sponsors, especially without our ArcelorMittal Projects India. And we will, and also our teamwork engineering solutions, and we'll see a couple of sponsor videos from them now.
So thank you again to our sponsors. So I'll invite at this point, Mr. Martins and Ms. Amruta Vijayan to come back. She is the sales manager for South India for ArcelorMittal, and she will monitor the questions and answers. So please recall that you can enter your questions into the dashboard in the question pane and at any time, and they will answer, they will, um, answer your questions. So please be sure to put your name and your company name so we can properly introduce you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mary. And uh, thanks again, Zhao, for that uh, presentation. Uh, temporary application is something which is very, very common. And uh, thank you very much for the presentation. So uh, there are a couple of questions from LNT, which I think I'll go first. I'll split the questions and then we can take the first one. The first one, I don't know the name of the person who's asked it, uh, but yeah, the company is LNT. Uh, the first question is uh, the temporary application sheet file when you do uh, very close to a building, uh, a, a building or a road with heavy traffic. What are the precautions that we take, and is there any recommendation for the machine or the driving equipment that we have to use? Um, yes. Well, there are different ways to do it. I mean, if you really want to prevent or to avoid any disturbance or any vibrations, of course. Um, the best method is to use a press, so either ABI type or geek and press or things like this. You can go very close to existing um, foundations, um, but on the other side, you are limited with the length of the pile, so it's a trade off. Um, what we also saw is for mainly for also permanent underground car parks is that they use what we call a combination, so it's a cutter soil mix with a sheet pile wall, so the cutter soil mix actually will. Um, reduced um, resistance of the soil during a certain period and then you install the sheet pile with a small vibratory hammer so that the vibrations are very limited and this at least in, in Belgium and in, um, in the Netherlands is quite cost efficient I mean it takes a little bit more time than simply uh, driving the sheet pile with the vibratory hammer but it's quite efficient uh, the other thing is also what I think that my colleague presented in his presentation about the installation is what you we call pre-drilling. So if you really have a very hot soil, for instance, very close to uh, foundations, you can pre-drill at certain points, positions, mainly in, at the interlocks. And then you come with a vibratory hammer, with a resonance-free vibratory hammer, high frequency, uh, and this will reduce drastically the time of installation, but also the vibrations. And what uh, we have seen now more and more in urban cities is that um, you have these vibratory hammers. So as I said, uh, um, resonance-free and uh, high-frequency vibratory hammers. And then you have a monitoring system that you put on the foundations or on the buildings that are close by. And then once you um, uh, you 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 go or you you get vibrations uh, at a certain level. It switches off directly the, um, the the vibrator, and in this case, you are sure that you will never go above a certain particle velocity on the ground. So those are the the things that I see. Uh, we've also seen in the Netherlands, for instance, where they use uh, the sheet pile wall and they put it simply in the diaphragm, well, in the slurry, in the bentonite, so slurry wall, which is also a, a solution for the Dutch because they, they use the properties, the good properties of the steel, but they avoid the, the, the noise and the vibrations that uh, you ha would normally have if you are in an urban area. So those are things that can be analyzed, but it really depends on the soil conditions and also the equipment that you have at the, at the location. Right. Uh, the other question that has come up from the same person is uh, you showed the uh, circular uh, formation of sheet piles uh, without uh, special piles, without special connectors. So what should what would be the minimum diameter that we can form with uh, uh, such sheet piles? Or is there any recommendation of any profile which we can use to form certain diameters? 
Yes, yes, it will really depend on if you use U-Pass or Z-Pass, if you use double pass or single pass. So you, we have like five degrees that we guarantee, and I think uh, all the other manufacturers guarantee five degrees uh, free interlock. So if you do the calculations, you have 330 degrees, you need about 70 piles, and it gives you the minimum radius or the minimum diameter that you need for this circular coffer dam. Now, in the piling handbook, um, you'll find a table where you have for each profile the minimum diameter that you, you need in order to install the sheet pass without any special pile. Now, if you are a little bit below, you can also um, bend a couple of piles, so you don't need to bend all of the piles because this is quite expensive. The circular shape will not be 100% circular. It will look a little bit like a potato, I would say, but it's also something that works. And if it doesn't work, then you have the hexagonal uh, shape, which is, in my opinion, an alternative and a very good alternative to a circular shape if you don't have a uh, diameter, which is enough. Yeah. So I think we'll share the link to the piling handbook page reference also when we answer to all the questions. Uh, okay. that couple of questions from Simplex as well. Dr. Uh, v. Barkumar, I'll take one of them. First, um, uh, you had mentioned about uh, double U piles arrangement, uh, where uh, he feels that the fabrication of driving cap appears to be complicated. So, when we purchase sheet piles from uh, Aslamithal, will you provide a suitable driving cap or uh, at least the details for fabrication? The driving cap. Driving cap, yeah. Yes, okay. The yes, so. Um, well, if you use an impact hammer, uh, you should obviously use a large driving cap. Uh, if it's an hydraulic impact hammer, normally these driving caps are manufactured also by the um, manufacturer. So, for instance, IHC has the impact hammers, but also the driving caps that are adapted for the U piles, for the Z piles, and also for the HZ. This is something that you can purchase from them. If it's a diesel hammer, in that case, we have also in our um, uh, well, in our, uh, in our program, we have also driving caps for uh, double piles, be it U or Z piles, for diesel hammers. Because this is something which is cost, uh, it has a certain cost, we can rent it, uh, you don't have to buy them unless you use them very often. There are different driving caps for, that can adapt, well, that, are, um, you, that you can use with uh, several profiles, but not with the whole um, program that we have. So if you use a small uh, profile and a large profile, you might need two different driving caps. And if you don't use an impact hammer, but a vibratory hammer, then you use those double clamps. And if it's with double clamps here again, it's the manufacturer of the vibratory hammer who can actually provide these special devices that you can adapt to the different sheet pans. But that's something that has to be um, checked with the, the manufacturer of the vibratory hammers. So for diesel impact hammers, uh, it's Aslomital that can supply the driving caps for single, for double piles. If it's uh, impact hammers, uh, hydraulic, or if it's vibratory hammers, then it's uh, the manufacturers of the equipment. But of, of course, we have also some ideas, so we can also um, give you some recommendations and talk to the equipment manufacturers if you have problems finding the correct one. Yeah. Uh, another question uh, from Dr. Barkumar again. Uh, this is uh, more of a software related question. Uh, so, uh, for drivability analysis, do we use the GRL Weep or any other uh, internal software of ours, Aslamithal software? So, can you guide him on that? Um, it, it is an, a very complex topic, and um, there are many companies who have tried to, to to develop such software, especially for the vibratory hammers. Um, I remember we were also involved in one of those studies in, in France, which was a European project, but mostly in, in French. Um, and um, they came up with a software which should, I would say, help the designer to uh, check the drivability. But it is so complex and there were so many parameters that, in fact, nobody uses it. So there, uh, I, I believe that for the moment, um, and there was in the past um, a software developed by the TNO in the Netherlands, 
which can simulate the driving with the Nitakama and also the vibratory driving. It's still available. It is not that expensive. And uh, according to the feedback that we get from some customers, it is a good tool to um, give you an, an idea about the, 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 um, the equipment that you need to drive the sheet pass, but it's not 100% foolproof. So a lot of times it's based on experience uh, that you will choose. And there's also some, um, I think that uh, Ernst uh, Weber, my colleague, uh, showed it. So there are some graphs in which also in our filing handbook that will guide you to a specific um, equipment depending on the soil conditions. But GRL WIP is one that can be used. I'm not very familiar with it. Uh, I know that we have used it in the past. And as I said, you can do it with that one. You can do it with other ones. Um, but don't trust 100% uh, that because it's also a lot of experience. Because we have seen in the past uh, one engineer that used this touch software and uh, he wanted to drive uh, well it was an AU17 which was 30 meters long and by experience it's almost impossible this is a, a sheet pipe which is way too slender to be driven with such lengths but with the software it tells you that you can drive it so that's why I'm saying be careful about the, the results because it, it's a software so it, it gives you a result but you have also to use your engineering judgment Yeah, okay. Uh, there is one more question from Dr. Balakram. I think we can quickly answer that, though we covered it in the first question. Um, it, uh, his question is, um, uh, is it essential to use only vibro hammer for driving, or we can use any double acting hammer? The advantage of the vibratory hammer is that um, it is relatively quick. It is quick uh, to install, it is precise, and um, <clears throat> There are many manufacturers. However, if you go into a relatively hard soil layer, then at a certain point, either you go to a very big hammer, vibratory hammer, or you go to an impact hammer. Very often, and especially for port structures, uh, people prefer to start with a vibratory hammer, and then if they get stuck, they use a huge impact hammer. Um, diesel hammers were used a lot in the past, but nowadays um, I would say that contractors tend to go to vibratory hammers because they are more versatile and they are more flexible compared to impact hammers. But there are still people using impact hammers also in urban areas. I would be more careful about impact hammers in urban areas because you may have different types of waves so different types of vibrations compared to um vibratory hammer especially when you use those uh, um high frequency vibratory hammers yeah it's always better uh there is a question from mr Wenker from petrofac uh, what is the allowable deformation for temporary sheet piles um well, that's a good question because it will really depend on the countries and on the applications. For temporary sheet piles, we don't see an, an issue if you have a deformation, depending on the soil and also the foundations that you have around. But if there is no issue with the settlements, a sheet pile can deform 20 centimeters, 30 centimeters, 40 centimeters without losing its strength. And if you want to extract the piles, you will be able to do it. So that's not a big deal as long as you are in the elastic uh, portion. So the cantilever wall, which deforms at the top 30, 40 centimeters, that's something that we see, um, and it's not a huge problem. Now, if you have foundations which are closed, then you have to be careful about the settlements. And this is something that you have to analyze. For permanent structures, normally in the Netherlands, they recommend a maximum deformation of 50 millimeters, so 5 centimeters which is very, very low, and especially if you use uh, light piles, you will be above those five centimeters uh, for an excavation of five, six meters. So I would say for permanent structures, 50 centimeters, uh, sorry, 50 millimeters is a good order of magnitude um, if it's really permanent, but if it's temporary, you can go to 20, 30, 40 centimeters 
if it doesn't have a direct impact on the foundations that you have uh, um, close to the to the excavation. Okay. Uh, right. This is a question from Mr. Andre Costa. I don't know the organization, but his question is: Is it possible to remove sheet piles when your excavations has a jet grouting bottom slab? Um, well, you it is possible to extract the sheet piles even when you have. Um, jet grouting or when you have a concrete uh, underwater basement slab for instance which is relatively thick as long as you don't have any elements on the steel which could actually be incorporated in the concrete or in the jet grouting so if you have a surface which is uh, in a uh, surface of, of the steel a bare surface of the steel or with the coating or whatever you will be able you have to be careful about the vibrations because when you extract the parts, you have some vibrations. So with the vibrations, of course, you lose this um, adherence between the steel and the concrete. And here again, you, you have to be careful about the, the, the levels of vibrations because you don't want to uh, destroy the concrete or destroy the jet grouting. But yes, it is possible, as I said, if you don't have any interference between the steel surface and the concrete or the, the jet grouting. Uh, okay, maybe I was also thinking if the sheet pile is installed with a rock bolt, uh, if it is a temporary application, how do we remove it? Well, the rock bolt I'm thinking about, and uh, at least the one that uh, we see here in, in the Scan Scandinavia, is uh, something that um, is um, fixed into a tube and then you drill into the, um, the rock and you grout it. So actually you grout only a portion of the rod so that your sheet pile, in fact, you will still be able to extract it. Now, in Scandinavia, normally when you do this rock vaulting, it's for permanent structures, which means that they leave it in place. But I don't see any issue if you do the rock vaulting in the correct way to extract the pile because the only thing that will actually uh, bond is inside of this tube, uh, which is a small diameter tube, uh, 50, cent uh, 50 millimeters, 80 millimeters, or 100 millimeters, with this uh, grouted cement inside. And if you pull with the vibratory hammer, normally you uh, destroy this bond and you will be able to extract the, um, the pile. I'm not sure that you'll be able to extract the rod, however. So the rod might stay in, in the rock. So that's something that uh, should be investigated uh, if mm -hmm. you really want to extract also the rod um, then the, the, the we would have to look at a different uh, solution so a more complex one but uh, something where we can extract the rod also okay uh, okay uh, anyway uh, i think we are running out of time and uh, i have this last uh, question from we have already i think over short the allotted time uh, from Steny. Uh, yeah, let me just take that question. Uh, yeah, I'll read out, her, uh, read out the question. I see you uh, referring uh, to variable frequency vibrators to be used in very tight locations with the sheet pile wall, almost adjacent to existing buildings. With these vibrators, there's almost no damaging vibration to existing structures. Could you please address this issue? We we have, I think, spoken about this, but maybe since it's the last question, we can just, uh, you know go through it uh, once more so that you know it, everybody's clear that uh, variable frequency vibrators probably are the best go-to option. Um, yes, well, uh, and uh, you saw it also on the movie. Um, I mean, very close is quite difficult with uh, if you have sensitive um, foundations. So if you have shallow foundations and you want to drive the sheet pile very close, then of course you will have some settlements, and settlements may be um, a huge problem for adjacent structures. But if you have deep foundations or deeper foundations, then it's not a big deal. And on the movie, you saw that they were driving the sheet pile around three meters from existing structures. I've seen uh, sheet piles that were driven um, almost 50 centimeters 
from uh, a residential area in uh, on a beach so where you don't have any foundations actually for the for the um, for the residents uh, which was three levels and um, there were no no damages in, in fact they installed like 500 meters of wall and they broke two or three glasses uh, so three windows due to the um, due to the vibrations but that's that was it um, so I believe that if you take the right um, equipment, so vibratory hammer, uh, and compared to, well, in, in well, in um, depending on the soil conditions, also if you take the right equipment, you adapt it to the the soil. Uh, as I said, you will be able to drive very close to um, existing buildings. But as I said, if you have shallow foundations. Then it might be a problem with the settlements because um, whatever you do, if you excavate, um, you will have some settlements, uh, deformations of the sheet piles, deformations of the soil, and you might have these difficulties. And what happens with the vibrations is that actually you're compacting a little bit the soil, especially in in, um, in sandy soils, so that uh, at the top, mainly at the top, you are compacting it, and you will have some settlements. So this is something that you have to analyze. If, you can, if the adjacent structures can live or can um, can survive those uh, small settlements, then it's not a big deal. Otherwise, as I said, there are some uh, solutions where you pre-drill before you drive the sheet pass, and then you have less um, less vibrations or less settlements, or you use a combination of uh, of cutter soil mix and and sheet pile walls, and in that case, you, you can drive it, but of course, if you are close close to the sheet piles, sorry, close to a, um, a building, existing building with shallow foundations, the best method is really to use a press. Because with the press, you might have some small settlements because you, nevertheless, you are compacting the soil, huh, whatever you do, but uh, you don't have these vibrations. So if you're really very close, I would say now 30, 50 centimeters close to a shallow foundation, use a press. If you're a little bit uh, further away, we can also use a vibratory ammo. All right, I see more questions coming in, but we don't have time. We cannot take it, but as uh, uh, every time that we say, we will answer to all the questions, uh, share it with DFI, and uh, uh, the questions along with links will be given to you in detail. And uh, we will look out for more avenues of uh, knowledge sharing with DFI and DFI platform. And thank you very much, DFI, for giving us this opportunity. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much, DFI. See you. See. You. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your expertise with us. Very practical, very informative discussion on the use of sheet piles for temporary applications. So we're, we're grateful for all the time and effort you've spent to prepare and deliver these presentations and participating so actively in this webinar series with us. So many, many thanks to Mr. Martins and Ms. Amrita and ArcelorMittal. Thank you. Okay, so again, this is the end of our educational webinar series on steel retaining structures and foundations, and we look forward to announcing the next series topic in December and launching the webinar series in January. And in the interim, we welcome you to register for the DFI of India 2020 annual conference. This is the 10th anniversary conference, and it is such a celebration. We're going to be, we're going to be presenting this in, in, in two years. So we're going to do an online conference in November this year, and we'll hopefully have our in-person conference when the world settles down next year in, um, in November next year. So the, the conference this year is all online. It started in August with, with three webinars. So we had three online webinars. August was helical piles, the use of uh, the seismic performance of helical piles and by Amy Serrato, world expert in helical pile technology. Our second one was in September, and this was our colleagues at the European Federation of Foundation Contractors talking about trimming concrete and support fluids for deep foundations. And our third webinar in October was 
our friends at ISSMGE who were speaking about deep mixing. So these recordings are available for people that have registered and will register for the upcoming November conference. So the virtual conference will be November 19th and 20th, the afternoon of November 19th and the morning of November 20th. We are very excited for our our internationally recognized keynote speakers. Maurice Batu, who's the general manager of Frankie Foundations, will be talking about auger cast piles and drill displacement piles. Dr. Tony Marinucci, Antonio Marinucci, will, is the president, excuse me, of Advanced Foundation Solutions, and he will be speaking about new tools for performance monitoring of deep foundations. Dr. Conrad Felice will be speaking, he is the owner and managing principal of CW Felice, and he is based in Seattle, and he will be speaking on the use of geotechnical baseline reports for foundation projects. And then, of course, internationally recognized Professor Harry Poulos. We're so excited to have him presenting on the use of piling for infrastructure development. In addition, we will have a panel discussion that furthers the conversation in India about continuous flight auger piles, CFA piles. And so DFI of India undertook a detailed trial program for, for the piles, installed piles with Indian labor in Indian soil conditions, and it tested them and proved that, that CFA technology is viable in India. To further that conversation, this panel discussion will address the risk and risk allocation and design and testing changes that are required to convert board pile projects to CFA projects. It, it, it's a, a very viable strategy for converting projects that come out in tender as board pile projects into reliable, responsibly designed CFA projects that can be validated and verified. So we encourage you to join that conversation and, and hear about those very re realistic strategies for advancing the use of CFA piles in India. Our moderator will be Madan Kumar, and I'm from, he's the head of engineering for Keller. We'll have Andres Bacarizo from Keller in the US who's converted many CFA projects. We have our owner representative, Mr. Mr. Panwar from Engineers India Limited, and our longstanding representative from Bauer, Bauer Machine in, in Germany, Mr. Franz Werner Garrison. So please join us for that conversation. So here's information on how to register for the conference. The registration includes the recordings from the original webinar. So if you did miss those, you can still have access to that content with your registration for the, for the November event. You please contact our very, very capable DFI of India staff who will be able to help you with any questions and your registration. And you can download the brochure from the handouts. So you can see the rest of the technical program um, that's it's in the handouts in the GoToWebinar uh, dashboard. Wanted to say sponsor opportunities are open for the conference. So we thank our sponsors that have already stepped up to contribute to help us. We cannot do these events without sponsorship. Um, the whole idea behind DFI is to knit our community together and advance the use and understanding of deep foundations. And we, we cannot do it without sponsorship. So we're very grateful. So kindly register, uh, contact us if you have any questions. And we thank you again for your attention and for joining us on this, this great webinar series, the first, the first of its kind for DFI of India. And we'll leave you with a short video on DFI awards and recognition that we just presented at our conference last week. It recognizes um, DFI of India's own Dr. K.S. Ramakrishna and his Distinguished Service Award. So thank you. Contact us if we can help you. <laughs>